Now, this is... This is a bit of a Ford-based show because we were staggered to hear the other day that they're thinking of pulling the plug on the Mondeo. Now, this is enormous news. In Britain, losing the Mondeo is a bit like, well, losing the royal family. Yeah, and if that happened, <laughs> someone would make a documentary about that. Quite, which is why we decided this week the Grand Tour should make a documentary about the passing of Ford's medium-sized family saloon. High performance version, the world's first ever fast Ford. And this is what they came up with. Life doesn't get much better than this. Cadwell Park, sunny day. Mark 1 Lotus Cortina. This thing is a riot. It had a revolutionary twin cam 1.6 litre engine, which sounds like a murder of mad bees. It revved like hell all the way to 8,000 RPM and produced 105 horsepower. <laughs> oh, wow! The result was some spectacular performance. The road cars would do 108 miles an hour, and in race trip, that shot up to 145. That was the stuff from spaceships back then. And best of all, if you were really on it, it would lift the front wheel in the corners. On the downside, it didn't stop properly. And there was very little grip. So it was an oversteer mentalist. It was also astonishingly brittle. Autocar magazine ran one for a year. 29,000 miles, and in that time, it needed six rear axles and three sets of rear suspension and probably a whole load of new half shaft as well because they were made from chocolate. But it didn't matter because the Lotus Cortina wasn't designed to last a lifetime. It was designed to last about 40 minutes because that is how long a race lasted. Back in the early 60s, saloon car racing in Britain was just about the most exciting motorsport the world had ever seen. The massive American Fords would roar down the straights, and then in the corners, the army of minis would be right back at them. It was beautiful, snarly chaos. But when the dust settled, it was the Lotus Cortina that was doing the winning. It actually won the championship in 1964, and it didn't only shine on the tracks. In 1966, it won the RAC Rally of Britain. They even drove one down the bobsleigh run in the Italian resort, after which the Cortina had been named. Here's what the famed bobsled run looks like from the driver's seat of the world-famous Cortina. At this point in history, rationing had only just given way to the Rolling Stones. Hemlines were going up and all kinds of groovy stuff was going down. 
and the glamorous Cortina caught the mood of the moment perfectly. It was exciting. The first car ever that made the ordinary family man feel special, like he wasn't just a downtrodden cog. And it was the same story with the Mark II Cortina and the Mark III. The result was spectacular. One car in every three sold in the UK was a Ford, and one in 10 was a Cortina. Everyone I've spoken to while I've been preparing this film has said the same thing. Oh, yeah, my dad used to have one of those. I mean, on the crew here, whose dad had a Cortina? <laughs> Just look at that. It's everyone, apart from the director, obviously, who has a double barreled name, so his dad had a Range Rover. But anyway, the point is, these were the best selling cars Britain had ever seen by miles. Of course, it wasn't all rampant sexism and hilarious handling that Ford used to make a name for its family saloon. There was some important business stuff, too. Back in late 1960s Britain, if you earned £3,000 a year, the government would take 41% of it away in tax. So to get around this problem, a lot of companies paid their staff a bit less, but then to make up the difference, they gave them a car. And that wasn't subject to any tax at all. Ford cottoned onto that and came up with a variety of trim levels to suit the typical management structure. There was a base model for the sales rep and the L for the sales manager. Then you had the XL with a clock and a locking glove compartment for the sales director. And the powerful GT for the managing director. Ford's badging policy quite literally changed the class system in Britain. Because we used to judge people on how they held their knife and fork or whether they said toilet or lavatory. But after the Cortina came along, it was all based on what it said on your boot lid. Our dads understood what these badges meant, and boy, oh boy, so did we. You join me in Doncaster, outside my old school, and I remember very clearly coming out of that door one afternoon in 1969, skipping along here, coming round this gatepost here, and I noticed that parts over there was a 1600 E, an E in amber gold, just like that one. And in it was my dad. And that was impossible. The E was the absolute king of the hill. It had four dials set into its wooden dash. It had a leather and aluminium steering wheel. And on the outside, there were row style wheels and front fog lamps. It was beautiful and wondrous and exciting beyond words. I can still remember now, vividly, how I felt. My knees actually buckled. I mean, the hairs on the back of my neck are rising now in exactly the same way as they did on that autumn day 50 years ago can also remember the enormity of the hug I gave my dad because I was just so proud of him. I mean, he had an E. An E stood for executive. My dad had a 1600 E. I mean, that, that meant he was better than the Duke of Edinburgh. A few years later, in South Wales, another young boy called James May went through the exact same thing. I was at my mate Andrew Jones's house, just up the road from ours, when his dad came in and said that my dad had just arrived home and he had a new car. So, I went outside and there, parked next to the curb, was a brand new Cortina GXL. And I thought, well, that can't be my dad's new car. But it was. <laughs> This was the all-new Mark III Cortina. 
And because it was the GXL model, it had chrome strips on the grill and a vinyl roof and four auxiliary dials that were angled towards the driver. It also had something called a rev counter, and I'd never seen one of those before. But when I looked at it, I suddenly became aware that my body could produce semen. Unfortunately, not all children in Britain were as fortunate as James and me, because some of them were born in Birmingham. And you couldn't really have a Ford here because this was the home of British Leyland. I grew up here on this street and I remember the day my dad came home with our new car. I prayed it would be a Cortina, literally prayed, but it wasn't. What it was was a shoulder-sagging bag of disappointment called the Austin Allegro Estate. It doesn't even have four doors. What was my father thinking? Why did he do that to us? I fell to my childish knees, threw my head back, and I howled at the sky. Birds across Birmingham took off. Deer in Stratford-upon-Avon looked up. Such was my horror. This was the summit. This was it. This is the best that we, the Hammonds, could do. We lived in suburbia. People drive past all the time. They see your car. They judge you if you have a wishing well or a gate. We had this on our drive where people could see it. Because my dad had the GXL, he got the brake servo and the alternator as standard. I'm sorry to keep banging on about this GXL thing, but my mate Lonnie, his dad only had an XL. So he was scum. I walked home from school. That wasn't because I wanted the exercise. That's because I would rather walk or hop or crawl 30 miles than be seen getting into that. It's cars like this. It's secrets, dark secrets like this, lurking in people's past that creates serial killers and psychopaths. It's a bloody miracle I'm not one. It's not being short that makes me an angry man or being born in Birmingham. It's this. It's you. I could have been great. I could have had dignity, social standing. I could have mattered. But you came into my life. My dad bought a Mark III Cortina because he had three children and he wanted them to be safe. And he knew they would be safe because Ford had made a film telling him so. We've got the teddy bears in, we've got the golf clubs, we've got the racing car. And if you don't happen to carry those things, but you have a bigger family, you can pack those in as well. Even with five children in the back, you can drive in a more or less relaxed fashion, safe in the knowledge that they're kept in the four-door Cortina with childproof safety locks. I've never driven one of these before, and to be honest, I never wanted to, because that really would be meeting a childhood hero. I love it, though. Ah, thanks, even better now, can't you? What about this one? I'd say. Back in 1974, we used to have regular power cuts because of the miners' strike, and there was absolutely nothing to do in our completely pitch black house. So I used to go outside and sit in my dad's car and just pretend to drive it, which was brilliant. Not least because you could turn the light on, which you couldn't do in the house. Mmm, light. Mm, mm. Oh, I used to love the power cuts. Outside of Birmingham then, everyone, young and old, was in love with Ford's four-door saloon. Because of this love affair, Ford sold a Cortina somewhere in Britain every 47 seconds. In 20 years, they sold 2.6 million of them. And let me put it this way, British Leyland took twice as long as that to sell half as many minis. The Cortina then had become a part of the fabric of Britain. It was the nitrogen of our existence. But 
on the 22nd of July, 1982, Ford pulled the plug. And that was the end of that.